Hi, this is Greg the Hammer Valentine, WWE Hall of Famer. You got to stay tuned because I'm ready to do a great big interview about my entire career, which is 40 years plus. I'm still going today on Hannibal TV. So stay tuned. No holds barred interview with Greg the Hammer Valentine. This is Hannibal from TheHannibalTV.com and I'm with WWE Hall of Famer Greg the Hammer Valentine here in his new hometown of Las Vegas, Nevada. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great. <clears throat> Thank you. Ooh, I'm a little hoarse here. Right, I just my <laughs> deep voice. I'm, I'm fantastic. I love being out here too. Yeah, the weather uh, is pretty nice. I guess you don't have to worry about the the tropical storms that you'd have to worry about in Tampa. All I have to worry about is moisturizing. <laughs> it dries you up, dries your skin up out here, but you know, it's a real, it was a real good choice for me. I've been here a year and a half and uh, after 33 years in Florida, it was, it was time for a change. So to start this off, what was it like growing up in a wrestling family with uh, Johnny Valentine as your father? It was like, uh, actually it was a pretty normal life, but he was gone all the time, so. And Nobbs was telling us uh, that he was quite a ribber. Did he ever play any ribs on you, is it? As yeah, a matter of fact, he did, you know. Uh, he didn't do it till I went, I, I flew down in the summer of 69. That sounds like a song. <laughs> Yeah, or maybe it was the summer of 70. You know, I, I, I think it was 69 though. And I, I went on the road with him for three months. He was a Texas heavyweight champion. That curtailed his Dallas Monday, Fort Worth Tuesday, or maybe I got him, maybe it was Fort Worth Monday, Dallas Tuesday, San Antonio or Austin on Wednesday, Thursday he went to Corpus Christi or a spot show. Friday was a big show in Houston with Paul Blas. Saturday was either off or there was some kind of spot show. Sundays he had off. And that was a great experience. He lived in downtown Dallas in a place called the Manor House. He never even had to leave. It had his own grocery store. It was a high-end high condo and he was up on the 50th or whatever floor. It was a lot of fun. And everyone says he was one of the, the toughest wrestlers and one of the most believable wrestlers. Why was that, in your opinion? You watched it, if you could watch it. I mean, he didn't worry about the crowds saying boring or anything like that. It was, he was just, he was intense. He had this intense look to his face and he just projected it that way. And when he hooked up with somebody, it was like, ooh, you know, you could feel the, the arena rumble. I and mean, it's just the way he did everything. Everything was thought out. You might, some people might say it was slow. Actually, the right word is methodical. And he just, he did the whole match that way. And then when it was time for the baby face, most of the time he was a heel to make a comeback then the action would start, you know, and then he'd cut him back off. And he was so believable that, you know, I remember watching matches and I'd be down at ringside. I was just a 19 year old kid or 18 and, and um, you know, just everything it was just so solid. The matches before that, you know, I could tell it was, there was a big difference. When did he actually smarten you up to the business? Because he doesn't seem like a guy that would have told you at a young age. Yeah, you know, that I, he was very disappointed because a couple of guys, I can't even remember their names, underneath guys, and they, they showed me how to go up for a slam, and they called, showed me a couple other things, and I'm thinking, oh, these guys, and, and explained to me why they're their matches look so uh, set up or 
like they had a routine and and uh, so it kind of gave me a when I told my dad somebody told me how, someone showed me how to go up for a a slam he goes what and he's driving a the car they told you what and it was like he wanted to hit me you know he hit me a couple times and uh, you know and I guess his favorites were the laxative ribs. He loved his, you know, his ribs always had something to do with poo poo, or I could say shit, I guess. S H I T. A lot of those ribs were done with that, and they, some of them were, you know, they, he was notorious, and everybody knows about these ribs. And, uh, he would deposit, make little deposits in guys' bags. Uh, not necessarily he would hate them or anything, but it was just like the new guys that were coming around. He would literally shit in their bag, or he would have a styrofoam, this, a styrofoam cup like, like this, and he would somehow curl it like a Dairy Queen and set it behind them in their little locker space. He was... <laughs> It's like, what? You know, you never heard of this kind of stuff, you know. And uh, he, he had uh, a very good sense of humor. I remember, you know, back in the old days, that Dad would carry uh, honey around with him. A lot of the other rest, wrestlers did, too, for energy. Yeah. Uh, as, you know, other than they'd take a little swig of whiskey, too. No pills or anything back then, you know, and... and uh, one time he had this referee, it was in San Antonio, he had this referee and he had a bunch of honey in his hand and he hit him in the ass and the guy went out to uh, wrestle and he, or referee a match between a bear and somebody else. But the bear had a muzzle on him, you know, <laughs> so he hit him with the honey, he know he's refereeing this match against a bear and a wrestler, they had those back then, you know, man versus bear wrestling bear. So as soon as he got in the ring, the bear smelled the honey and he took him down and he was licking his ass. <laughs> and the referee finally got away from him, you know. That, that, that was a kind of, but you know, he had the muzzle on, but he still got him down. Yeah. And the fans were, they were going nuts. It helped, him, probably helped the match. Yeah. <laughs> So when you were uh, initially trained for pro wrestling, who was it that actually trained you? Uh, Stu Hart. Stu Hart was the first one that, that really smartened me up in the dungeons of, the famous dungeon, all it was really is a basement in his big house. He had a big three bedroom house and it was in the basement. What were your initial impressions of Stu? Because we've all heard the story that he was impressed with your arms when uh, he met you for the first time. Yeah, he picked me up at the airport and uh, he didn't have a driver, but he had a big long uh, Fleetwood, like a limo Fleetwood. And uh, he had, <laughs> I was getting my bag and he goes, he had big arms and he was feeling my arms and he talked like this. Uh, Stu is a great guy. Yeah. What happened uh, with his cats every time the phone rang? Somebody told me to ask you that. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to use this on my comedy routine, but it'll be funny to hear me do it live, I'm sure. But uh, Stu had a way of talking. And, you know, you'd call him, you know, and he, a promoter would call him or a wrestler to get booked, and he would be on the phone for an hour. He loved to talk. And it took a while for him to eh, eh, between the eh, eh, to get the words out. Eh, you want to come? Eh, September or eh? You know, it was always like that. So it took forever. But he had a pencil, and he'd always had that pencil there, and he'd use that like a magic wand or something. You, you know, I just something to diddle with him on the phone all the time. The cat would come up there and circle around him and. And he would play with a cat's ass or his balls with the eraser part of the pencil. <laughs> so this went on forever. So finally he get off the phone 
He'd throw the pencil down. The cat would leave. He would leave. As soon as the phone rang again, the cat would be there. Take off. Zoom. He'd be right there by the telephone waiting for Stu and the pencil thing. Wow. So the cat was queer for having, <laughs> having the eraser on his balls and his ass. <laughs> He beat Stu to this one forever, you know? And you teamed with Flair a lot earlier in your career. Uh, what are some of your memories of him? Crazy. Great guy, great talent, just crazy. It was perfect, you know, because I was laid back. It was perfect. It was a perfect combination, and it was good for me to be around someone like that. And. Um, I actually, uh, I idolized Rick on his interviews, you know, and so I tried to keep my timing with his, you know, and he was great, great performer. Um, he doesn't wrestle anymore, but he probably still could, you know. He, Rick was a, a great partner. What was it like going out with him because he was quite the party animal, I understand? Yeah, he was nuts, you know. And, We'd share a room sometime, and he'd, he'd, most of the time we didn't, though, because he was too wild for me. He, th he, he would get there, and he'd, we'd be on the seventh floor in the hill, and he'd throw a mattress out the window or something, and just crazy stuff like that. Do you All think right. the, uh, the 10,000 women is accurate? Or, because I'm sure he's been with a lot of women, but that's the number he's thrown out there. Wow, you know. Yeah, it could be accurate. <laughs> I, he's been married, I don't know how many times. Um, Enough that he still has to work. Yeah. He, he's, he's just a phenomenal, he's, he's nuts, you know, but he's, he's, he loves this business. Probably the greatest worker of all time, except for my dad. But I mean, Dick, Rick is different, but you know, he's a, uh, He's, I, I wouldn't be surprised 10,000 women visited him. And speaking of that, I know you've been married 22 years, but you were single a lot of your career. I understand back when you were breaking in, there was a lot more groupies than there are uh, overall today in the wrestling industry. Yeah, there was all, and, and they were good looking, you know, they were good looking girls. And women are attracted to you if you're an athlete, plus they're attracted to, you know, if you're on a stage of any kind, like a rock and roll, just stage or movies or they're pro wrestling, they're attracted to that. And, and, and they should be, you know, because we're real men. And, uh, but it seems like so one-sided that the men are the ones that are supposed to be all the horny ones and want to be you know, with some girl, and, and it's really not that way. It's, uh, especially if you're a celebrity, you know, uh, I used to think all these women wanted to be with me because I'm so handsome, and debonair, but <laughs> I sure, you know, it, it's just that they want, they like the, the celebrity part of it. I'd see ugly wrestlers with beautiful women, so there you go. And I understand you were quite a ladies' man because I was shocked to hear that uh, even in the later years, Medusa went out with you for, for a period of time. Yeah. I, uh, I try to stay away from talking about that, you know. I, my wife, Julie, we've been together since 1995. We have a great relationship. Great. That's, that's when all the parties stopped when I settled down. And everyone, those, definitely those kind of parties, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure you got more partying in, in the, your younger years than most people do in a lifetime. So. I still like to get together with the guys and have a few drinks, smoke, smoke the weed. You know, that's that's about all I do anymore, and and um, try to stay out of bars. You know, it's definitely. Well, speaking of weed, it's legal in Canada now, and it's it's also legal in Vegas. Do you think it's going to become uh, more accepted overall in the U.S. pretty soon, or is this going to be a long battle? I doubt if they ever legalize it in Florida. 
and New York, but maybe New York more, I can't believe Massachusetts it's legal, you know, it's just like, and all of Canada, that's great, and uh, Nevada, California, Oregon, Washington out here, um, Colorado, of course, Alaska. Vermont. Vermont just went that way, yeah. I know a lot of guys. Back in the days, I used to buy my weed from Vermont. A guy happened to be a lawyer's, uh, a lawyer turned me on to the guy, and he sent us great stuff. Vermont's got that good soil. Speaking of which, uh, I do have some mango weed candies I bought last night if you want one. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Just remind me at the end. And back to wrestling, of course, your famous dog collar match with Roddy Piper. What are your memories of that and the build-up to that feud in one of the matches that people still talk about today? Yeah, uh, actually, I battled Roddy. I was the U.S. champ, and I battled Roddy for a long time up to that. And, you know, Roddy was a great babyface, but I, in my opinion, better heel. But he was really good at both, but... Uh, we, we wrestled each other a long, long time, and he told me about this thing he wanted to do with this dog collar, and he presented it to Jimmy Crockett and George Scott, I believe, or Ole, whoever was the booker back then, but uh, mainly Jimmy Crockett. They went for it, and it started out, I was, I got, it was on my birthday, and I was doing a TV tape, and I had this big cake, and I went to cut it, and pulled out this dog collar on the, on television and uh, build it up for the dog collar match. And we did that. We talked about the dog collar match about 10 minutes before we went out to do it. And that's why it looked so real. Because we didn't sit there and talk about what we were going to do. We just ad-libbed it. And that's, you know, we, we had an ending, but the ending was kind of, but at the end, Roddy was going to get his Duke raise. It was a U.S. title match, but it was non-title. And uh, we just made it made it a real gruesome match. And Piper had some little tricks that he told me that we could do with it by stretching the thing out and you know on the chain, and because uh, he brought that dog collar from Oregon, and. Uh, so we said, let's go do it. Let's steal the show. Let's knock it out. Let's, this is for the people because we got paid pretty good, but not nearly as much as we should have, you know. Should have been $100,000 or a million. Man. Yeah, that was the very first Starcade, wasn't it? Yeah, and it was actually the very first uh, pay-per-view for wrestling, but it didn't go into the cable at, at, at your home. You had to, it was closed circuited, like they did boxing back years ago. And you could go see it in a theater or a bar or something. I think, I think a sports bar has had it, you know. And I know you were around Dick Slater a lot in those years. Do uh, you have any stories about how tough he was? Because you always hear he was a guy you wouldn't want to mess with. He just had those big, he was, he didn't even work out that much. He was just a raw boned guy that knew, knew how to punch. He could punch your lights out, you know. And, and uh, yeah, he, Dick was a, another real good friend of mine. He passed away and he had a, they actually did something where they operated on his back. They did the same thing to Hogan too. They operated on the wrong side of his back. They screwed him up even worse. This is in Florida, so you want to get operated on, go somewhere else. Like, Rochester, Minnesota or something, or Cleveland. They have <laughs> great hospitals there. But yeah, they messed him up and he was like on a walker or a thing that you drive around for a long, long time after that. And then you get all, take all these Oxycontins and stuff and that messes you all up. So he really had a rough life after the wrestling part, but he was a great wrestler, tough guy. And speaking of wrestlers that have had a rough life after the wrestling part, Billy Graham's not doing too well these days. Uh, his mobility's bad and he has a heart condition. Do you have any memories of, of working with Billy Graham or being around him? I guess you were probably both heels. 
in Calgary, he was breaking in when I was breaking in. Oh, so, so you were there from the start. Yeah, Wayne Coleman. And big, big arms. And he, he was really, uh, he impressed me. Um, he learned, same time I learned, you know, and, and, and Billy, uh, Billy turned out to be a good worker. But he was more the razzmatazz, the interviews. I mean, he didn't go out there and go an hour broadly like I would or Ric Flair, but you know, he, he did what he had to do and he really got over it, especially in New York. And somebody told me to ask you about getting in a fight during the 79's trap match with Chief <laughs> J Strongbow. Yeah. And this guy sued me, by the way, and it was on, uh, it was on video and the WWE's lawyer was taking care of it for me. He calls me up, he goes, you know, he says, this is bad, it's on video, Coliseum video out on VHS. And you can see the guy, he reaches over to grab, I, I, was, I was grabbing a chair and he's fighting with me in the chair. And I pulled the chair away from me and popped him. And he just, he wobbled, so I hit him again and tried to knock him down. <laughs> and, um, it was all on video, so he's suing me, and then uh, I guess he didn't have, you know, he, he was a loner or something. He, uh, he ended up dying, and I remember the lawyer called me and goes, well, the case is off, he died anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then a, a woman in Roanoke, no, Norfolk, Scope, or Hampton Roads, Coliseum, I was wrestling Wahoo and we were chopping the shit out of each other, going back and forth. And I went, once again, I went to grab a chair and I, apparently I tore this woman's arm when I grabbed the chair and she sued me too, but she died too. So that's a warning, you try to sue me, you're gonna die. <laughs> Everybody died. <laughs> and of course, uh, you had a lot of championship matches against Bob Backlund that were pretty good uh, back when he was world champion, any memories of those and what kind of a personality he is? He's a great guy, another good friend. And I remember when I first went to New York and they built me up about four months on the TV before I ever went to the garden and we did, I did figure fours on everybody and, and they would carry him out, everyone, and on a stretcher. So it was very believable back those days. And uh, so I'm thinking it's gonna be a Everybody's got short matches in New York. I watched them and they pulled here and, and they did everything it wasn't believable. I said, this could be a cakewalk for me. I was just gonna grab a hold because they'd never seen anybody wrestle before. And, and uh, you know, it'd be something new. I used to talk to my dad after he had the plane crash and he'd always be saying, yeah, you grab a hold and wrestle. They'd never seen that before you know, you'd be able to do a lot. So I'm thinking short matches and they come up to me and they go, and it's the first night I've ever was in the garden. And they go, we want you to do a straight through 60 minute match with Bob Backlund. And I heard Bob Backlund was really hard to work with. Uh, but you know what, after 10 minutes, he, he got winded a little bit and so did I. And then I'm used to doing the long matches and Bob was beautiful and we had a lot of great matches after that. You just had to tire him out a little bit, you know, because <laughs> he used to flop it, but he was in tremendous shape. In a shoot match, I wouldn't have had a chance, you know. Do you think he would have done well as a heel if they had turned him earlier during Hogan's run as, as champion because he seemed to do well in the 90s as a heel, but he was past his prime by that point? Yeah. Yeah, he could come off like running for president or something, some yeah. crazy guy, or he could do the Wall Street gimmick with a, like Mike Rotundo did with the IRS. He could do something like that, change his whole gimmick, have him, have him wrestle with, his, with a suit on or something, or suspenders, and you know, that would have been great for him. And of course, you had that uh, memorable feud with Tito Santana, any memories of that? Just fabulous matches, Tito was perfect. The angle was perfect where I figure for him after I beat him and he had to get an operation anyway and it was just done so well and so believable and and you know every every match 
that I had with Tito was a classic. And we actually went out, back in the, those days, the WWE, WWF, whatever, ran two to three shows a night. So Hogan would be on one and Tito and myself would be on another one. So we didn't need Hogan to sell out, we'd sell out anyway. Right. Yeah, because they had the A, B, and C shows in those right. days. And you were on main events all the time, not only with uh, Tito, but often on those B shows you would be against, what, Randy Savage and others yeah. in the main event. Yeah. What was it like in Ricky those... Ricky Steamboat would be another one. What was it like when uh, wrestling hit hugely popular in those days? And I guess you would probably were recognized everywhere you went. You had an action figure. Oh, it was great. You know, you felt like a movie star. It was great to be recognized. It was a great time. Everything was brand new. We're, we're being broadcast all over the world, in Europe and every place. And it was a great time. Everything was innovative. Everything was brand new. Saturday night's main event was, you know, it pulled like 20 million people rating uh, on NBC, and I was on that a bunch. It was, it was great. It was a great time to finally be in recognized like a real celebrity or a real sports figure, you know? And I've heard some horror stories about wrestling the Junkyard Dog uh, during the time he was in WWE in the 80s. Did you have good experiences in your matches with him or did you have difficulty? What takes a good worker is being able to work with a broomstick. That's what my dad, that's how he explained it. He said, you should be able, you're the heel, you're the guy, you're the champ. You should be able to have a match, literally, with a broomstick. So some of these guys could not work that well. So you just had to work around them. JYD would hear the crowd. He had four or five things he did. And I just made sure he liked to do that dog thing where he'd run and give you a headbutt. I'm thinking that's so silly. But I, you know, I ended, I'd have him knock me down and I, you know, just come up and he'd do it and the people would pop. So you just have to, to uh, work around everything and adapt yourself to every style. I can't go in there and work with Junkyard Dog like I would Ric Flair or Tito and chop him and, you know, I'd still get a few chops in there, but you, you know, he wouldn't like that, you know. And I don't want him to beat me up because he really was a, a good, mm, I don't know, wrestling, no, just oh, big, tough, big, tough guy. Did you have any say in uh, being tag team partners with Brutus when they put you guys together as the dream team? Well, they, George Scott was a booker then and they wanted to do that. And I said, that's fantastic. And what makes a, a tag team work is to have a captain, which was me, Brutus was green, but he was still good. So it worked out perfect. And if we had a problem, you know, the Bulldogs would pick on him sometime and stuff, but uh, uh, I'd tell the guys to knock it off. You know, it, it ended up being a perfect combination. Uh, there's no other, the dream team, I actually, you know, I thought of the dream team. I thought of that name. There might've been a NBA basketball or people that use the Dream Team or O.J. Simpson Dream Team, but we were the first. And uh, they actually went with that name, Dream Team. We were actually had more fans a lot of places than, than the, the other good guys, so-called good guy tag teams, except for the British Bulldogs, it was a perfect match. God, we sold out Toronto and Montreal back to back. And we were the top, we weren't like semi-final. Once again, we were the main event tag team, British Bulldogs against the Dream Team all over the country. We even wrestled uh, Sheik and Volkov. And so it's like a heel match, but we were baby faces. Like in Anaheim and Seattle, a lot of the, a lot of the out here, a lot of the West Coast towns, they, they threw that in there. And it did great. Their most famous matches as the Dream Team was WrestleMania two against the Bulldogs with Ozzy Osbourne in their corner. Uh, what was that like and did you get to meet Ozzy at all? Yeah, 
And you know, I, I had met Ozzy before in Japan, and actually uh, the two drummers, uh, they ended up forming some group, uh, gee, I wish I could think of that, Night, Night Ranger? I think so. They formed Night Ranger later on. But they invited me and Adrian Adonis, speaking of Adrian, God bless him, we were down in the bar at the Keel Plaza, high-end hotel where we were staying. They invited us, we had a day off, and they invited us to come to the show. We sat on the, uh, we sat on the stage with them, and it was fabulous, you know, and then I don't think he remembered, I said, remember it took, I don't think he remembered that, but Ozzy's, you know, he's a trip, man. I love that TV show he has with his kid. I'm really impressed that he's still alive with all the drugs he's done over the years, but I'm happy he's alive. I'm a big fan. Me too. And you mentioned the Bulldogs uh, messing with Beefcake a little bit. Uh, did you notice the ribs that they were playing in the dressing room? Obviously, the most famous was the the stuff that led to the Rujo incident, but uh, mm. I, heard, I heard they messed with Outback Jack a lot too. Yeah, they, uh, we could talk about this because both of these guys have passed away, so. And Outback Jack, I don't know where he is, but they, they halcyoned him, and that was a sleeping pill that you would put in someone's drink, and so he was knocked out, and he always wore that hat, so they took the hat off, tore it all off, then they shaved his head, and this is all on an airplane, and people are looking at that. <laughs> They put big, they didn't shave it all the way, just a big track, to, you know, and he was like, and then they, they plastic, they put super glue on the hat and put it back on his head. So he couldn't get it off when he did, he tore his hair off. And I wasn't around, I just got away from that. And I got away from when he was, uh, when he was uh, getting his bags and stuff, but I heard he, ripped the hat off and it was a horrible scene. And Outback Jack, so ended up, Outback Jack shows up and Jay Strong was sitting back to the hotel. You can't wrestle like that. And you know who got fired? Outback Jack. Well, I guess he was a dispensable <laughs> one. <laughs> I heard he was pretty hated overall though, backstage by everybody. He thought he was a big star. Yeah, he just didn't have the personality to fit in. Here you come in, all these WWS stars. There was about 15 of us, maybe more, but around that number that were being used real good. And we were like a family and it was hard to break into it. And you could tell this guy was an ass jerk. He just couldn't acclimate himself to be one of the boys. You gotta be, you gotta be able to take a rib and, but stick out for stick up for yourself. And uh, it was hard. It was hard, you know. And after you split up with Beefcake, you teamed with Dino Bravo for a while as a new D D Dream Team. Uh, any thoughts on that and the terrible uh, death that happened to him with his murder? Yeah, I, sh I, I wish I would have given Dino more of a chance. I, uh, we wrestled together and and uh, he just didn't have the timing that I was used to and I, I couldn't control him. But you know, I didn't know it was all politics back then and they, they wanted to put the belts back on the new dreams. I didn't even know this, you know. And uh, they had this stupid angle where we were going to steal the bulldog, and they were, we were going to come out with a, a collar with no dog on it and walk it around, you know. And I guess that would have been good, but back then, I'm, I'm serious, Greg Valentine. I didn't want to go for it. And we actually put over the killer bees one time in Madison Square Garden. And I, you know, I, I said, okay, you can take the fall on me. So I just had him, I was going for the figure four, and one of them jumped off the top. It was a good finish, I thought about myself, but at the same time, it really pissed me off, and so I quit. I got on the airplane the next day. I had like 14 bookings coming up. I got on the airplane the next day, and I just flew home. And the airplane was empty, and all of a sudden I see, <laughs> I see Hogan, 
up in first class. So I'm trying to hide from him, you know. And uh, I just wanted to be left alone. So I get home and Vince calls me and eventually I answered it. And I was on the phone for four or five hours with Vince. If I would have been smarter back then, I would have turned him down, but he talked, because I could have been one of the four horsemen. I had something else set up. Oh, really? Yeah. Could you tell us that? Uh, well, I got a call from Jim Ross. I think J.J. Dillon was part of it, too. They go, yeah, we're going to turn Barry Wyndham babyface, and you'll slide right in as one of the four horsemen. Had this all planned. Well, Vince heard about it through the grapevine. He heard I, I went to Dallas and had a meeting. I had a meeting with him actually before this incident in the garden where we put the killer bees over. And nothing to do, you know, I, I respect Brian Bear and Jim Brunzel, so had nothing to do with them. I just, I didn't think it was good business. And um, I don't like doing jobs. So, uh, you know, they talked me into coming back and then he eventually got got me. <laughs> Vince finally got me, uh, what else was it? Yo, with the earthquake. The earthquake thing, I went around and beat Dino Bravo, but I, they were set me up to do the big job for earthquake at WrestleMania 7. And I remember Jay Strongbow came up to me and he says, they, wanna, they don't want this match to go over five minutes. And that pissed me off. I said, I ain't doing it. That's bullshit. Five minutes with that big fat piece of shit. And, I, and I'm sorry, that's the way I felt about Earthquake. I'm gonna let that big blob beat me in five minutes. You know, I have respect for myself, let alone, you know, I guess, you know, I hate any time I see that and I look like a midget compared to him, but it shouldn't, it was, it was a mismatch Shouldn't have been done that way. Uh, you know, nothing against Vince. I like Vince now, but it, it really put me in a predicament. I didn't appreciate it. And you would have been a huge star, like even bigger star than uh, you ended up being if you had joined the Four Horsemen. Cause I oh, think yes, it would have been it would perfect. Yeah. And Vince heard this. Somehow he heard... I mean, there was, it's like the White House, <laughs> there's the leakers, yeah. all these leakers that said, I went to Dallas, I went to Dallas and met with all of them before. You, you were friends with them in real life too, so you would yeah. have fit in. It would have been like, perfect, and Vince messed that up. Thank you very much, but uh, you know, he's, he's looking out for his company. At that time, my name was, was big and I could have went and used it. Instead, I go back and got abused but thank, you know, I went to WCW, they, they didn't even use me that well. But I found, and because the wrestlers and Bill Watts and all these guys were running it and, uh, and running the bookings and they tried to take advantage of me and they wanted me to do a job for Sting on television and I just packed my bags and left, you know. That's not the way I do business. I don't do jobs on television unless they were gonna let me come back next week and do something big that would shoot me back up so but you know what I found uh, I found out about the independent market and I was big on the independent market and I went to Europe with the ultimate warrior I mean there was all kinds of independent stuff that was out there and my name my star was big and I kept it and you know what I, I think I overcame that earthquake job and Vince Kudos to Vince, he finally calls me and says, I want to put you in the Hall of Fame. So that was a thank you, Vince. And that was, that shot me back up, shot Greg Valentine's star back up. And a lot of other guys, it was 10 of us that just really started the Hall of Fame again. It was WrestleMania 20. Jesse Ventura, Sergeant Slaughter, Bobby Heenan, Don Morocco, Dio Santana. Uh, Junkyard Dog, um, uh, John Studd, and they're the ones that weren't alive and present at the time. They had their, Junkyard Dog had his daughter there, and then uh, John, John Studd had his son there to take the awards. So it was a great, a great boom for me. I got, I'm not blowing my whole horn, but this is, 
everybody knows that they announced this on the stage in the garden, all ten of us standing there, and when they mentioned my name, I got the loudest pop because New York was my town. New York, I had a lot of long friggin' matches with Backlund and Tito and Ronnie Garb, Hulk Hogan, a lot, a lot of history. New, New York was my town. I still go back to New York a lot. People still want to come and see me and get my autograph. New York was my town, still is. And you mentioned Adrian. Toronto was too. Bye. Yeah, you were really popular uh, all over Ontario, actually. But uh, you mentioned Adrian Adonis earlier. Were you there for that infamous fight he had with Spivey? No. I was sick. I was at home very few times. I called in sick. And uh, I missed that. It was in a, I think it was in Green Bay. Uh, it was in Michigan, I think Flint, Michigan. Okay, yeah, yeah so it wasn't a TV thing. Yeah. No, it wasn't. Yeah, I heard about it, oh my God. Uh, they tried to take, I guess, I don't know how it really started. It started in the ring and, and Spivey got mad. And Adrian disrespected Spivey and said some, called him a jabroni or something, don't mess up. And then he, so, when they got, I guess he nailed him a couple times in the ring, Spivey did. I don't know how the match turned out, but it, it, it got screwed up. So Adrian, uh, so Spivey went to Adrian and uh, said, so what the hell are you doing? And, and then, or Adrian, vice, could have been vice versa, but Adrian, long story short, shot for him, shot for his legs. And Spivey was there and just beat the living hell out of him. I Two days later, I, sh I showed up the Rosemont in Chicago and I walked in and here's Adrian. He looked like a friggin' alien movie. His head was this big around. And he showed up to wrestle Hogan and they wouldn't let him. I mean, it was like, I'd never seen anybody beat up so bad in my life. And I've seen a lot of that. This is unbelievable. I mean, just, oh my God. Uh, he survived it. Uh, oh. Did you get along with Adrian behind the scenes? I did until they turned him to this gay Adrian Adonis and then a couple times I went up to talk to him and, and uh, I don't know, he said something real condescending to me. Like, oh, now you want to talk to me all of a sudden, I go, you know what? I don't ever talk to you again. I walked, I, I, you know what? Don't talk to me like that. He's all of a sudden, you want to talk to me now. I don't remember, I was just going to say hi to him because you know, we, we haven't really talked since he, you know, it's, this whole thing, I mean, blew his ego apart uh, or shot his ego way up there where, you know, he just wasn't friendly to any of the guys. So, you know, don't talk to me like that. I knew Adrian, I knew Adrian back in Buffalo before he ever got into business, um, so. I heard that Pat Patterson in particular was a big uh, supporter of yours. Uh, did you guys know each other before the WWE days or was he just a big fan of your style once he saw you in WWE? Yeah, we just had a good relationship and he lived in Florida, we went over and uh, my wife and I would visit him. We just had a good relationship all the years, you know. I respected him the way he worked. He was like a race, you know, Ray Stevens was his partner and I, I got to be Ray Stevens' partner as a world tag team champions in NWA. Another, they were just exactly alike, so um, I, I have a lot of respect. I love Pat Patterson. What was that saying that uh, Ray Stevens would say when he was drinking? Do you remember? Uh, help me out. Do I don't. I don't know it, but I've I've just heard several people tell me that. Uh, I wish I could remember because we did a lot of trips together. Something like I'm a fucker and a fighter and a wild bull rider. That could be like it, that. right? Because he, he rode bulls and he was a rodeo guy too. The guy was a tremendous athlete, and you wouldn't. 
you know, he, he didn't work out in the gym all day. He just had all the tools. He's the first guy that showed me how to take like an arm drag type thing and just keep rolling with it so you roll right back up on your feet because I'd watch him do all these bumps, hip tosses, but he would just roll instead of taking a bump and just laying there, he'd roll right back up on his feet, on his feet again and take another one roll and then finally he'd lay down and sell it, you know. Where my dad would take a, would not take a lot of bumps, I eventually started doing my dad's thing because I didn't have the back that Ray Stevens did. I would throw my sacroiliac out and I couldn't move. So if I sold a bump, I'd do it like my dad, a big slam and he'd go, ah, uh, you know, you sold it. Maybe only one or two slams, a guy pick you up, give me another slam and you, uh, Ray was a nice flow. It was good for tag team, but single matches, I went to, to the slower style, selling. And what was it like wrestling Hogan when he was at its peak and main events all over the place? Oh, it was great. He didn't have to do nothing. You know, I put him over on everything, you know, and he'd let me chop him and everything. But when I'd eventually get him down, he would sell. And those, he didn't have to do anything. He'd just go like this and people, he just get him down, hold him down, boom, 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 hold him down some more. And <laughs> it was like picking grapes. It was just so, you had the people in the palm of your hand with him because he was over, over so much and they fed him heels. Good thing about me was I, they would feed me to him, but I had the IC belt too. So I had something to fall back. But I could work, you know, I could take care of myself. Even if I did a job in the middle of the ring uh, for Hogan, I'd do something where I'd beat myself too and come off the top rope and run into his leg or something and boom. They didn't even have this program, but he would tell the referee, tell Greg to jump me and put the figure four on me. So I'd get my heat back. I didn't come from Vince or the office, that came from him. That's being a friend, you know, so. So when did your friendship uh, start with Hulk? Oh, wow. Well, I guess when I first went to WWF, 84 or something, when they put the belt on him. Uh, and I had Bruce with me later on. And I think, you know, being he, he married Linda and moved not far from me. So he was a great host. He'd had the big, a lot of guys just migrated to Florida. You know, I'm still considering him one of my best friends in the business. No ego, no nothing. The guy, the guy knew what he was. He, he's the biggest ever. How is he doing these days? I'm sure you still keep in contact with him. Yeah, he's doing great. And they're getting ready to do a movie about him. And I, I hear Bradley Cooper's gonna be Vincent. Man, that's what I heard. They have, they have called me, I'm gonna do some meetings with the directors, producers, whatever, of this movie. They wanna talk to me. So make it, I, I think they're gonna do a round table type thing. Cause I was from that era that they're gonna film about. So there's a lot of movies that are coming. They're good. The WWE is gonna do a movie about Roddy Piper. So they, they contacted me about that too, so. And you worked with Randy Savage a lot. What were those matches like and what was he like behind the scenes? In the earlier years, Randy was great. And uh, I didn't see much of him. I mean, we, 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 we were starting the XWF and we wanted him to be part of it, but uh, that didn't work out, so I brought Piper in instead. But uh, uh, in the early years, Randy was great. He'd come over to my house all the time. We'd smoke some weed together, and Elizabeth was good friends with Julie, and you know, he was great, but he got, got you know, I, when I, him and Elizabeth split, it was a whole different thing with him, and he got, kind of became, you know, a recluse. He'd pop out every once in a while, but 
It was hard to get to. I'm guessing you probably didn't see the, the Vice documentary that was recently done on Savage and Elizabeth. No, I haven't seen that. They also did one on Brody. Did you ever uh, have much contact with Brody over there? I met him one time in Chicago after the matches at a bar. And, uh, well, I went to Puerto Rico after that, after the thing happened where he was murdered. And, uh, you know, it's just, I never, our paths never really crossed one time. It's a, and one of the shows that you wrestled uh, Randy on was WrestleMania 4, um, and that was one of the Donald Trump WrestleManias. Did you ever meet Donald Trump at those WrestleManias? Yeah, Glad, thanks for bringing that up. I sure did. I stayed away from him, you know. Uh, I'm thinking, ah, oh, he's a billionaire, he don't want to talk to me. But he, he calls me over backstage. I think this was uh, either four or five, I can't remember which one. He calls me, he motions to me, and he goes, hey, I just want to tell you, you're one of the best wrestlers I've ever seen. I really enjoy watching you. And I shook his hand, I said, thank you very much. And then he, he, uh, he met Julie and everything backstage too, and then uh, he's very nice to her. So you have a beautiful wife. And so after that, I became a Trump fan. <laughs> yeah. Before that, I was jealous because he's a billionaire. You know, uh, but I'm, I'm a Trump fan. I guess you voted for him then. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I voted three times for him. <laughs> and you had a feud with Ronnie Garvin uh, around the late 80s, early 90s. How is it to work with him? There's another guy I love, like Tito. And there's another guy I could hit and then get hit harder back, but he didn't, you know, that, that style that we had and that, uh, that angle that he had that we did, some people call it a mid-card match, but we ended up becoming the main event in a lot of places and Ronnie's, you know, that style, those matches, they, it all collimated to the, one of the uh, Royal Rumbles or something where we, had the I quit match and and that ended up you know I, I get a lot of compliments just like I do for the dog collar match that you know the Ronnie Garb and the I quit match with the shin guards and everything and a lot of people love that match so that's another iconic match Ronnie Garvin's a great guy when they told you about the uh, Rhythm and Blues tag team shortly after that, were you for that tag team at the time? Yeah, I was for it when I had my blonde hair. If finally, you know, I just, uh, for a year or so, they wanted to do the black hair thing to shock the people. and uh, Jimmy Hart finally talked me into doing it. <laughs> And, but you know what, I, I look back at it now and I, I think, you know, you know, I, at the time I've been, you know, I've watched the business change and I'm watching, it got really gimmicky and, and I'm trying to hold out as a hard-nosed wrestler and trying to make everything believable. And I still wanted to do that, but I said, you know what? This is a departure for me. I'll go out and be a showman. You want me to be a showman? I'll be it. So I end up putting a lot into rhythm blues. And I actually really, I look back at it and I laugh and I join and enjoy it. Um, but they cut it off. And uh, sorry they did because we could have, I think we could have did very, very well as world tag team champions, but they cut it off because <clears> of <throat> the signing with the Road Warriors, I believe, so. And you were main eventing some shows. I remember uh, at the Ottawa Civic Center, for instance, it was the Rhythm and Blues against the Hart Foundation right. main event. So I guess the paydays were pretty good in those days. Yeah, and we were actually gonna take the belts off the hearts. That was, you know, but Vince went another way when he signed the Road Warriors. He always wanted the Road Warriors. And uh, so he laid us off, but we still got paid. He didn't fire me. I went to Japan and, and, and I just started being on it. I go to Japan once a month and 
they eventually brought me back uh, to work against Dino Bravo and set me up for WrestleMania 7, but yeah, it's no big deal. I, business is business. Is it true that uh, it was Jesse Ventura's idea to dye yes. your hair black? Yeah, yeah well, he told, I don't think that they were announcing, but he, I don't think he said that over the mic. He said, wouldn't it be great to see Valentine come out with black hair and the people would be shocked. And you know what, it was a shock. And I guess it was a good idea to do that eventually. And you know, so I went for it. Jimmy Hart actually talked me into it. So I went for it. Were you friends with Jesse behind the scenes? Yes. I liked the way he always talked about me. He always talked about my style, and so he always stuck up. For, he always stuck up for the heels, but he really stuck up for me. So, you know, I'd listen to commentating back back in the day. Gorilla Monsoon always talked good about me. Said it took ten minutes to warm me up, which is which was true. And I I listened to that stuff. Me, and Gene Oakland. Oh my God, what an announcer and what a good friend he was too. What did you think about them putting the Honky Tonk Man in the Hall of Fame finally this year? I think it's great. I, I'm, I think they, you know what though? I, I'm thinking, when are they going to do it? You know, it's good that they did it in New York or Brooklyn or whatever. I think it's, it was perfect. And I, and for Beefcake, I think it was long overdue. You know, both those guys, my partners, and and uh, I thought I thought it was great. I didn't get to see all the induction, but I, I saw parts of it. Do you have any funny stories about Honky Tonk Man that the fans might want to hear? You're around him a lot. Nah. I don't know. We, you know, it's a, when we were together, we, we never went to the bars. We hung out at the room together. Uh, uh, I can't really think of any funny stories. We. I know that he was instrumental being, for himself, he was going to be instrumental in making sure he kept that IC belt longer than anybody. He manipulated and moved, and I, I respected Honky for doing that. They wanted to take the belt off of him, and he said, no, I'm not doing it, you know, and I respect that, because usually I, I said, okay, I, I'd let that promoter have his wish most of the time. Um, and they released him before you left, is that correct? Uh, shortly after that Rhythm and Blues run? Yeah, because they put him in the booth with uh, Vince and uh, something happened there that Honky didn't like it anymore. So he left. So I'm, I'm back with the blonde hair working against Dino and yeah, he... But then we got together afterwards. I told him about the independent stuff and how much money he can make, and he jumped right on that bandwagon, so. Yeah, I think you two are two of the guys that have made the most money on the Indies. Yeah. Wrestling the most since the, the 90s up until today. So you were saying that after the rhythm and blues situation, um, Honky Tonk Man left, and you went on to become a babyface. Was there ever any ex explanation why you became a babyface? I remember I, I flew in from Puerto Rico to do the show, and uh, that was the last time I ever saw Dino Bravo, by the way. And <clears throat> I'm wrestling Saba Simba, which is Tony Atlas, Saba Simba. And it was a very grueling match because he was trying to get his gimmick together. We, we potatoed each other, oh my God. Um, in fact, Vince even came up to me after the match and said, you guys okay? And uh, yeah, I'm fine, you know. So through potatoes, a couple of, Tony's a real tough guy by the way too. So, but we ended up where Jimmy threw me the guitar and I went to uh, hit Tony. Instead, I hit Jimmy Hart on the head and uh, so the people pop big time in the garden and I just was, you know, so I guess it was a face turn. They, 
I never actually got hold of Jimmy. He just ran. But they they actually cheered for me. And uh, they've been watching me being this mean, nasty guy from 1979. I believe this was 90 three or four, 92, 92, yeah. So, I could have been a strong face turn. Um, but but I ended up leaving not long after that, so. So was that on a house show, or was that on like a, did they actually show that turn on TV? Because I yeah, don't- Yeah, it was okay. at Madison Square Garden. Okay, I see. So it was on, on the uh, USA cable, or I mean, it, it got a lot of, and the live, they used to do a live feed to uh, Madison Square Garden Network, MSG Network. I see. So I guess you just didn't like how you were being used. They never really gave you a push as a face. Right. You were just kind of a generic wrestler at that right. point. Right. And that's why you decided to go to WCW. Who did you talk to about jumping? Uh, well, they already had that big, big offer for me with some really good money to be the four horsemen, but like I said, they, I backed out of that. So they still wanted me. The deal wasn't quite as sweet, but I did get a pretty good guarantee. And I went down there and uh, was Terry Taylor's partner and they made us a tag team champion. So I was in a tag team thing again. It never, you know, I'd rather be singles, but tag team, as long as you got a decent partner, you know, you can, I, I, I'm a good tag team guy too. How did you get along with Terry Taylor? Because I don't know if it was just because he was an agent. A lot of people uh, hold animosity towards him, I find. You know why? Because he always got, he, he's always getting a job. I guess he's got a job at WWE. Or I mean, yeah, he's a- Why should he have a job? And I, you know, I don't care. But I guess he's a better, I don't know better whatever I don't know what he's better at than I am, but uh, he's definitely not a better worker. But there's certain guys that they think would be good in the office. Apparently, they don't think I'm good in the office, and I don't give a damn. So, so who was it from the office uh, that was that was contacted you when you joined WCW? Was it Bill Watts at that time? Um, no. I can't remember. I I think it was Dusty Rhodes. Oh, Dusty Rhodes. Yeah, yeah. He was a booker then. You and knew him uh, from Florida, I guess? Pardon me? You knew him from Florida and WWE? Oh, yeah. We always had a good relationship. I was kind of a baby face in Florida before I left to go to Carolinas the first time, and uh, I was Dusty's partner. Yeah, I have a lot of... A lot of good friendship, a lot of good memories about Dusty Rhodes. Uh, any stories about him that uh, people might want to hear? Everyone loves Dusty Rhodes stories. Oh, God. I know he stuck up for me a couple of times because Dick Murdoch wanted to beat me up when they were the outlaws. And, and maybe he could have beat me up, I don't know, but I was... I was in an argument with him in the car. Can't remember what, the, but I was riding around with the outlaws, which was Dip Murdoch and Dusty Rhodes, and Dusty stuck out for me. He said, "Leave the kid alone," you know. So we've always been good friends, and uh, he helped me do the set me up with the elbow thing. We filmed me breaking boards in the ring down at the Sportatorium in Florida to send out before I actually went to the Carolinas and got my big break there, so. What was the th uh, heat with Murdoch all about? He was just picking on you? Yeah, that's all. I ended up being, he just had that personality, you know. Yeah. He called me a pot smoker and I said, well, you're a friggin' drunk and, you know, you he took too took much He also took speed, beer. right? Huh? He also took speed from what I understand, didn't he? Dick, yeah. yeah. That, that, that could be very true. I know he definitely drank. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jim Ross said that the speed was his key to, to drinking and driving all those years without being in a major accident. That could be it, yeah. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. And Andrew Anderson told me to ask you about how the Ultimate Warrior helped you overseas. Oh. Uh, he... 
Well, actually, I, I'd never been a part of this, holding a promoter up for more money. And he wanted to do it in Vienna, Austria, and the place is sold out. I was working against Jake. I think Hercules was working with the Warrior. He says, I want more money. He goes, would you refuse to go on till you got more money? And I've never actually ever done a thing like this, but uh, you know, I said, you know what, I, I want more money. <laughs> so I, we held them up, but the, the people weren't riding yet because the matches, the preliminary matches were going on. And I think we held them up uh, on time as far as going out, maybe 30 minutes longer than it should have been. And then I went out and worked with Jake and then Warrior worked with Herc, but we held them out. The, I remember the, the I don't remember who the promoter was, but he was like, huh, this is silly, this is ridiculous, I can't get, get you American money, this is Australia. I mean, Austria. And I can't get America, pretty so like 50 minutes later, they came in with a bunch of Halliburton suitcases full of money. And I got my good share of money. And I, after that, me and Warrior were best friends. <laughs> And that was on an independent show? Yeah. 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 So you guys didn't talk much prior to that when you were in WWE together, I guess? My wife was good friends with his wife. Yeah, we did talk. We did talk, but we never made trips together or anything like that. But we were friendly. You know, I didn't have to work with him that much. You know, and thank God, you know, because my style was, you know, but the matches that I did have with him, I, like I said, the key was to work around. It was a, the match. We had a Saturday night's main event match. It turned out real good. Have you heard that his wife is now on the WWE creative team? Yeah, I just heard that, and I had no idea. What do you think about that? You're not on the creative team yet. Uh, <laughs> the Ultimate Warrior's wife is. Not that you would want to be, but it's, it's strange. You know what, I think, uh, yeah, I think I should have a job for doing something, you know, but, uh, you know, I don't, you know, you don't want to give me, a, you know, I could definitely help them out, at least making things more realistic, you know. I, I think it's good to have, I'm a wrestling mind, it's, uh, you know, I'm in my late 60s now, so do the math, that's 40 years of wrestling knowledge here. You could definitely, if I'm at a meeting, you could definitely jerk something out of my head, or I could jerk something out of my head to help them out, you know? And uh, so I wouldn't beg them for a job, but I would love to do the creative thing, you know? I, I would love to do that. I guess you would probably consider doing that for AEW too, if they offered you Cody Rhodes's uh, company there that he's involved with. Kudos to that. I mean, they're out here in Vegas for three or four days, and I'm doing autographs for them. And, uh, you know, WWE doesn't bother me. They let me do what I want to do, and I appreciate that. And um, so they, um, I'm, I'm open for almost anything, because right now I, you know, I'm freelance, and, and I stay busy. You know, I'm busy all Every other couple of weeks, I'm out on the road, and I enjoy it. I still enjoy working. Um, I enjoy meeting all my fans. I didn't realize I had so many fans, you know, to be honest with you, until I moved out here to Las Vegas. Because in Florida, they're, they're used to seeing wrestlers. They're not used to seeing wrestlers out here. I go anywhere, and I'm attacked, but they have... I go to Caesar's Palace a lot and, and gamble the sports book, you know, sports gambling. And uh, I take the wife there a lot. And uh, there's a transition of different people coming in all, every week. And so every week they're seeing me. And, I, you know, it's, it's good that uh, I never turned out a selfie. And I, I enjoy it. And all my, fr all my fans are very friendly to me. And they... They really enjoyed my style and they enjoyed the 80s, you know. And you mentioned you left WCW the first time because you didn't want a job to uh, sting. Did that have anything to do with him personally? Because we've heard from a couple of people that 
in those younger days he had a bit of an attitude or was it just that you didn't think it was right well, I didn't think it was right I have nothing personally against. I don't know the guy but uh, uh, he got a super push in WCW and did he ever come to WWF did he I ever? think he did a few matches just yeah. to do be brought in to do jobs on WrestleManias, I think, but he yeah. got huge payoffs for that. Yeah, um, yeah, they put him on a certain level that that I, you know, I don't quite understand. But uh, you know, I guess you know, it's timing for everything. Well, I'm definitely not going to do no job for Sting unless I get big money. Or something where I get to attack him later on. I, that's just, I'm old school. That's where, the, you know, I made myself, so I'm not going to disgrace myself for a few extra dollars. I'm not going to do that. And they brought you back to WWE in the Survivor Series 93 under a mask. Was that yeah. just a one-off or was that a new contract? No, I did the Royal Rumble later on. No, they were just bringing me on uh, for a a good payday, you know, so I, I did it. And I didn't like the mass thing, but who cares? You know, it's, it's about this a lot of times. And they didn't embarrass me any, so. Did Terry Funk tell you why he uh, no-showed that, even though he was supposed to be one of the knights? I guess he came and then maybe he didn't want to do the job or something and he left shortly before the show? Yeah, um, you know, I wasn't even aware that he was one of the knights. I guess, uh, who were the other ones? I, I can't remember. Some, the only reason I remember this name was it was an unusual name, a guy named Jeff Gaylord. I don't know who he is. Yeah, he's a big, tall kid, yeah. yeah but he was basically a, a jobber, you know, but a good guy, a big guy. Yeah, and I think the third one was supposed to be Terry. I don't, I don't remember who they replaced him with. I, you know, I, gee, I can't even remember this thing. I tried, that wasn't the high spot of my career. The main thing is they sent me a nice check. <laughs> and then they put me, they brought me back in the Royal Rumble and, and that felt good too, as Greg Valentine, not with a mask or anything. And I guess you, uh, you had a contract in WCW in later years too, didn't you? Yeah, I had one. Uh, actually, Hogan approached me and asked me. This was uh, in '97, I believe. Uh, and, cool, yeah. And he he talked to Eric, and they brought me in for a while. Yeah, according to the internet, they said you were off and on there from '96 to '98. I don't know if you were under a contract that whole time. I was a contract. Yeah. yeah. They just rarely used you, I guess. Yeah, it actually, it was a blessing in disguise. You I mean? They never hurt me. If I did a job, it was for a main guy or it was, I could set the job up the way I wanted to. Yeah. And, uh, and it Lex Luger and Randy and stuff like that, Savage. And then they, they brought me in and put me over on a bunch of matches too. So it was, uh, it was a good situation. I got a paycheck every, month, uh, every two weeks. Plus, being they didn't use me that much, um, I started booking independents. So I was working independents, plus I was on the big satellite TV. And so it worked out good for me, but they eventually uh, let me go. You know, but, but I had about a year and a half, I think, on it. How was the atmosphere in the dressing room in those days? Uh, there wasn't much of, and I, everybody was kind of like, they're on a contract and, you know, I got along with everybody, but it was a little different, but I wasn't really on the road with them. I would show up and do uh, a big show at arena for them where they were televising it. And then uh, did a couple of pay-per-views. But usually I was at where they would do the w, w, WCW Saturday night, which they, they would tape at Universal Studios. So it's kind of like the only time I would really see the other guys. So I wasn't actually on the road. So it was a good contract. I could do my own thing. And they used you, unlike Lanny, who I think just uh, sat out his whole WCW contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good though. If you can get money, 
pay you for sending home, you know. It was, I enjoyed it because I only had to go to Orlando once in a while and wrestle. And that, they kept me beating guys and then I'd tip my hat and let Sandy, uh, Randy Savage go over Lex Luger. The Lex Luger thing was good where I pinned him and he snuck up behind me and, and uh, put the backbreaker. I mean, it's stuff that I, when I know I have to do a job, I like to look like it could have went either way and they let me do that so how did you like wrestling in Japan over the years you enjoyed it I love Japan and I love it because I could work my stiff style and believe me if you didn't they would attack you and if you didn't hit them back hard <laughs> they would eat you up so it was perfect style for me and you wrestled for Antonio Inoki mostly, I guess? Yeah. How did you find working for him? He was great. A gentleman and a scholar, Inoki, and, and Fujinami, I, his protege, I worked with him a lot, and uh, Sakaguchi, stiff, oh, big giant guy, but had a great time in Japan. You had to work really hard, and I did six weeks a couple times, and. I, I told him I couldn't really do six weeks anymore. And so they cut it down to two and three weeks. Then later on, I just went over for a week, you know, so. But I like Japan, I love, love Japan. Any favorite matches from your time over there? Uh, the one with the Noki and, and, and especially some matches I have with Fujinami. He, he kind of had like a Ricky Steam, he had the American style down, so he was like working with a Ricky Steamboat who was great. And uh, so memorable matches with Inoki and Fujinami, both. And I guess you had some experiences uh, training with the Sheik earlier in your career? The yeah. original Sheik? I stayed at his house for a couple months and uh, went out on the road. He had a ring, big ring in the back by his swimming pool, but I never actually got into to the ring. I never really trained. What, what's a sheet gonna show me other than hook up and pull a pencil and stick it in my throat? So I was already, you know, I was pretty much past the green, I was still a greenhorn, but I had went through the, I had suffered the preliminaries with Stu Hart, so I was, I knew what basically to do in the ring, and I worked with guys like Bobo Brazil and Hackst Haystacks Calhoun and uh, Flying Fred Curry, who I had great matches with. So, I, and that's where I hooked up with Don Fargo and met Don Fargo. And um, then, uh, as far as you know, Detroit was great. Sheik was great. He gave me this horrible name called Babyface Nelson, and I couldn't wait to get rid of that. <laughs> um, but I, I wasn't ready to use my dad's name, so then I became Johnny Fargo. We went to Buffalo. It was great being Don Fargo's partner, too. He, he really taught me a lot. And you wrestled for the Insane Clown Posse uh, in later years at their uh, gathering of the Juggalos events. Any memories of those crazy events? Yeah, they were crazy events. I remember going, what up when they had the gathering out in Illinois, I believe it was Cave Rock, Illinois. And me and Tito had a cage match and they wanted, they wanted me to go over Tito this time. And, uh, but we wait, we didn't go on the, we did not go into the ring till four o'clock in the morning. This is crazy. And, uh, but it worked out good. We went like six, seven minutes and boom, boom, boom. I was out of there, got on, went to the airport, took a shower, flew home. <laughs> but the clowns are great guys. I, later on, I did a thing with them, <clears throat> the clown theater thing. And that happened, that was going on for two years. I was their bodyguard and, and I enjoyed all that with, the, they're super guys. What was the biggest differences between working for NWA and WWF? Uh, 
Well, I, I enjoyed my years of NWA. You said NWA, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I um, they were both great territories, but WWF was was on a higher scale because you had all those big cities and stuff. And and then when, when we popped and started, long from seventy nine to eighty four, I went back and forth all the time. You could do that back then, you know. Vince would. He said, I'm going to use you for about a year and you can go back to Charlotte. Then I'd call him up, I'd go back to New York, I'd go back to Charlotte, then I'd go back to New York, then finally end up staying in New York. So that was the best territory for money. Money was good in Mid-Atlantic too, but you didn't have to work as hard in New York. What was your favorite uh, moment from your time in New York? Favorite moment was, uh, I guess WrestleMania one, because I was the first one. A lot of, a lot of great memories. Uh, um, I guess Hall of Fame, two thousand four. That's that's a great memory. What was your favorite WrestleMania match that you had? Well, I enjoyed the Bull Bulldogs match, WrestleMania II. Um, but I think when we had the tournament, I believe that was WrestleMania IV. Yeah. Was that right? And I got to work with Steamboat and Savage. I think that was my favorite one. Do you have any stories about Andre the Giant? Fabulous stories. I first met Andre this is 1975, I'm in the back of this big 747 and a woman comes up and says, there's a couple of guys that want you to come up front. And this 747 was empty. I'm in the back and uh, first time ever going to Japan. And I went up to first class, went up the spiral staircase and up there was Arnold Skolan and Andre the Giant and I sat down with them and they wanted to meet me. They heard I was on the plane. And um, um, of course they knew Johnny Valentine. And uh, so I had a great time with those guys. They got me all, they were playing cribbage and drinking, drinking cognac and I got all messed up and went through cussings. But the main funny story I want to tell you was Andre and me, we used to go out late at night a lot and get food after it was over. The only thing it was, after the, mat, the mat matches and everything were over, the only thing that was open in Tokyo, really it was easy and accessible to get to was the Korean barbecue. So we would go there and drink the sake and cook our own food and it was great food. So we were calling the cab, we need to get back. And uh, all these cabs would not stop because here's Andre. Oh, no, you can't get in there. So they, they kept running off. So Andre, I says, Andre, why don't you hide over by there and I'll, I'll flag a cab down and then you can come out and we can get in and get, get out of there. And so he came around, this one guy, and he came around and the guy goes, no, 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 no. He sees Andre, he says, no, 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 you can't get in my car. And he, and he gets in and starts to drive off and Andre goes over and grabs the bumpers of cars and lifts him up and the wheels are spinning like this and the cab driver gets out, takes off running and me and Andre just stand there laughing and laughing. Finally, they got, they got us one of the, the big taxis so we could get back to the... I remember Andre on the, on the bullet train he was way in the back and he's up against the wall and I'm way in the front and a whole row of Japanese people in between. No wrestlers, they were in the other car or something. He, he'd he raise up in the back and he'd go boom, big old giant, giant fart, literally a giant fart. And the Japanese people all turned around and looked in unison at the same time. I go, hey! Then he'd do another one. Those are some funny stories. 
And do you have any stories on Kurt Henning? Wow. That's really sad that he passed away. Uh, I remember, you know, Kurt was just coming in like 82, and I'd work against him a lot, and he was a good worker then, and he'd do the favor and put me over. And But I remember sharing a room with a guy, with, with Kurt, and he had one of the Japanese wrestlers there. What the heck was his name? Um, God. Uh, he was... Pack song, yeah, that was Possibly. it. They would stay up all night playing cards, <laughs> and he and he would stay up all night playing cards, and then he'd sleep in the car and sleep in the dressing room. <laughs> the guy Kurt was a great guy. Do you have a favorite Don Fargo story? Hmm. Let's see which one I can figure out out of the archives. Uh, so Sam Mushnick and Pat O'Connor, Harley Race, they were in the office in St. Louis and they brought Donnie Fargo and myself in for a, a show. We came in as the Fargo Brothers and at the Keel Auditorium, St. Louis was big for wrestling. All oh, it still is, but that was the home of the NWA, so to speak. And uh, so they invited us over to where they were eating at some bar, was a restaurant slash bar. So Fargo goes, Fargo goes, okay, you go in there first. He, went, he took off all of his clothes and he just left his beetle boots on. He was naked as Jaybird. He says, you go in first and stand at the bar and I'll come in and order a case of beer to go with all the office people and all these, all these uh, fans or whatever, or just people that were happened to be at the restaurant. So Par Fargo comes in through the door, stark ass naked with beetle boots on, walks up and orders a case of beer to go, and he's standing there smiling with a cigar in his mouth, and everybody's laughing. And he takes a case of beer and we left. <laughs> oh God! Who is the uh, the toughest guy, in your opinion, of all the territories you wrestled in? Uh, the toughest wrestler. We already talked about Dick Slater would have been up there, but anyone else? A lot of tough guys, but uh, um. I guess Orndorff was a tough guy, uh, literally. Um, I'm, try, I, I'm trying to think of this. Uh, a lot of people put Haku up there. Oh, yes, thank you for that. Oh, yes, definitely. He chopped me one time, but I, th I thought my heart was going to stop. But yeah, you know, I, I could be in a bar right next to Haku or down in fact, this happened one place in New Jersey. They wouldn't come in and mess with me. They'd, they'd mess with the toughest guy there, Haku. I remember him just taking a guy down and pulling his eyeball out. He was, he was a legitimate, tough guy, probably the toughest of all. Were you there that night that the Rockers uh, had their bar incident before with Jimmy Jack Funk? before they were fired the first time? No, I remember, uh, I remember hearing about that. I, I'm not trying. I know Jimmy Jack Funk got into it with Haku and he took him down and was gonna take his eyeball out. <laughs> ah, that was in Dayton, Ohio at a Holiday Inn. I don't know if that was the same incident or not. Yeah, no, I think that was a separate incident, but. but uh, yeah. And there's a lot of fans on here asking you, what's your tips on uh, having such great hair? Uh, <laughs> thank you. I have a wife that takes care of my hair and uh, a lot of conditioning and, uh, you know, hereditary too, I guess. So my Johnny Valentine, my dad never lost his hair. 
right up to the end. So, do you have any old school advice for young wrestlers out there? Yeah, get a job. No, I do. make sure you have. Make sure you have that job or that diploma in your back pocket. It's not as easy now. I don't think it's as easy <clears throat> unless you get in and get lucky and get a good contract. I don't think it's as easy. Well, it wasn't easy back in my day either, but um, you know, just be careful. Don't think you're just gonna crack through the glass and, and be a star. It's very hard. There's a lot of competition now. Who was your favorite opponent over the years? Well, Tito Santana, Ronnie Garvin, Ric Flair. Um, I put Tito first there. Um, you know, Hulk Hogan. Uh, I actually wrestled Brutus some, but um, all those guys uh, were great opponents. There's a fan on here asking if you could tell us something about Hogan that uh, not many people would know. Ah. Uh, um, well, he's just, you know, I think he's an open book pretty much. He's, he's, uh, he's a genuine person. Uh, I can't really think, you know, like I said, he's, I, I, I can't see that he had anything that he'd want to hide or anything that, that you wouldn't know about him. It is what it is with him, I think. What do you think about today's wrestling? Uh, I try to watch it and sometimes I see good matches. Uh, I don't like all the interviews in the ring. If I was, say, they gave me a chance to to give my opinion on the matches. Uh, I would slow everything down. I would go back to wrestling. Uh, I'd re-educate the people. Um, I think I could show them how to, you know, you need, it's less, less is more. Uh, I think hitting a guy 20 times is way too much. So it's, it all comes down to slowing down, but I do still, see good matches, you know? So it's hard to judge. I don't like, I think there's too much wrestling on television. Yeah. What's your advice on being a heel? You were definitely one of the all-time great heels. Now, my, my advice, and being an independent guy or whatever, for who's asking these questions, or if you're a WWE star coming up, uh, you know, I was a wrestling heel, so I wasn't a cowardly heel. Uh, so a wrestling heel, I would just, the way I would do it and the way I would tell them is just be like, you know, I could tell you how to be like me. Be tough, be aggressive. The only time you start backing up or backing down from somebody is when you're starting to get the crap beat out of you. And then you can show a little cowardice there, but, you know, put the brakes on and then take back over again. But I'm from that era where I kept that baby face down until I was ready. He made a comeback. I'd take him back down again and uh, never let that baby face control the match. You know, you got to keep control of it. Was Wahoo McDaniel one of your stiffest opponents? Yeah. Yeah, I still got scars all over my chest from him. But I learned how to do, you know, I, back then I didn't chop him back, you know, but I learned how to do the chops from him, which I ended up adding to my, my style later on. Any thoughts on uh, Jimmy Snuka, who I know you worked with? Yeah, he's a Talofa brother. He's great guy, great star. Uh, I'm sorry to see him pass away. I really was. You have any stories on Rick Rude, another guy that unfortunately passed away? A lot of people would say Rick Rude was one of the strongest guys ever, and he was. We, 
I, some girl came up and talked to us at a bar one time, and he put his hand like this under her, her ass and picked her up like that with one hand like that in a bar somewhere. I remember this sticks out. How could you do that, really? I mean, he, he was an arm wrestling champion, a legitimate one, so. Wow. Yeah. Memories of uh, working Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Fabulous. This guy learned how to be a main eventer in about two or three years. He got, he, he just learned it. And he came into Carolinas in tag teams with Jay Youngblood and the singles and the matches I had with him was just, it, they were phenomenal. Any thoughts about King Kong Bundy's death? I was very shocked. I was doing a couple different uh, Fort Myers. I did a Comic Con down there he was supposed to be at and he didn't show up. I did another one in Kentucky not too long ago and he, did, he missed that one. And the promoter said he, you know, it was because of his feet, he couldn't walk or something. And, but I did see him in New York not too long after that, and uh, that he missed those shows. And I walked up, how are you doing? You know, and he seemed okay there. And then two weeks later, he passed on. You know, it, was, it really shocked me. Who was your favorite commentator to commentate your matches over the years? I actually liked Vince. I liked Vince and Jesse's combination. I liked Gorilla Monsoon, Bobby Heenan, of course, Mean Gene Okerlund. He did play-by-play. -play. They, they were my favorites. They, you couldn't beat those two or four or five. What are your thoughts on Vince Russo? I don't know him. Do you still wrestle? You already told me this off camera, but the fans want to know if you still get in there. Yeah, the last match I had was in Colorado Springs. That was last year. And uh, I kind of got away from wrestling, but I still would like to get in there. And if I do, I would like to maybe set up a tour. That would be my legitimate last matches. It could be three or four or five in a row. You know, I could still go, I still work out, I, I could still wrestle. Um, trying to send it off that way, I, I might do that, yeah. Did your father ever attend any of your WWE matches when he was still alive? Um, no, he didn't, because uh, he was crippled. But I actually did some shows after I left WWE, I, I went in, Jim Crockett was trying to promote, promote the Sportatorium, he had TV and everything. And uh, so I went in there and worked with a surviving Von Eric, Kevin Von Eric and a few other guys. So he would come down to the matches and see me. What were your thoughts on the ankle bracelet gimmick they gave you for a while there? That was a great, actually Vincent, Vince and myself at his office in Connecticut, we came up, Vince says, we need to give you a facelift, we need to, and he was right, by the way, we need to throw some spice, you know, because you've been here a long time, and we came up with the shin guard together, and that was a great, that was a great deal. Did you ever get into a, a real legitimate fight with another wrestler? Uh, You know, um, there was this one guy in, in uh, Mid-Atlantic, but I can't remember his name right now, but he, he, he's passed away now. But I mean, uh, he got mad at me because I was too stiff and he threw a couple shots at my face and I got out. Rick Flair was my partner. And I says, Rick, let me have him. And I tagged back in and I went at it with a guy um, but he was a pretty tough guy, but I can't remember what his name was. And I finally just front face locked him and choked him out a little bit. Um, that's about it, you know. Other guys, I would get mad in the ring sometimes, and 
and I'd throw a couple potatoes at him. It was no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and what are your thoughts on Billy Jack Haynes, who seems to have lost it over the last few years? Well, you know, I never had any problems with him, and I saw him the other day, and I couldn't believe it. But I, 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 I remember him beating up Iron Mike Sharp, but I wasn't there, but it was somewhere. And Iron Mike just used to throw these stiff, overarm things to the chest and and Billy Jack Haynes followed him back to the dressing room and I wasn't there once again but I heard he just beat him up bad and Iron Mike Sharp is the nicest guy in the world I heard that and that made me hate Billy Jack Haynes oh you just beat him up I wasn't even there I just heard about it but right after that Billy Jack Haynes got fired anyway so any thoughts about Bruce Pritchard, who's now back working for WWE? Yeah, there goes another guy at resurface. I guess he's got a good mind, you know. He seems, he seems uh, all together up there, you know. He's good with television and everything. And his dad, they, they did the stuff in AWA years ago, and they brought him in. And he was good at Brother Love, you know. So, you know. Hey, if you can get it, that, that's great for him, you know. What did you think about the theme musics you were given? Where Did you have a particular favorite one? The My music? Yes. Uh, Jimmy Hart did the one with the hammer thing, and uh, he played it for me. I said, that's good. It had no singing to it, but that was good. And then and the other thing with the Honky Tonk Man, we had his song, so. But I like the boom, boom. You, you hear the big sludge hammer and the music coming in, and that, that's good to come out to. What do you think about uh, heavyweight champion wrestlers being smaller nowadays than in the past? Like uh, someone's asking about Kofi Kingston, I guess, is the current WWE champion. He, he's a smaller guy. Is that the black fella? Yes. Or, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I don't know, how, what would his poundage be? I believe, I, I don't know, but I, he's under 200 for sure. Wow. Um, I, nothing against him or any of the lightweights. I, I believe the WWE or WWF has always made money with big guys. Now, say I'm a middle-sized guy, I'm six foot, 250, 268. And you could be 230 and six foot or whatever. I think that's a, that way, you know, being my weight, I could work with the big guys or the small guys. But uh, I like to see them at least 200 pounds plus. I think heavyweights uh, seem to draw the most money, you know, or guys that can work both ways. In my size, 250 or better, you know. Any memories of Bobby Shane and Buddy Colt in the plane crash? And Gary Hart was in that, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, what was the other guy? Iron, uh, no, it's uh, Adrian, no, not no, Adrian. No, uh, I know who you're talking yeah, about. I'm too. trying to get this. Uh, He's a Billy Graham lookalike, Austin Idol. Austin Idol, yeah. they, they were in it too. Yeah. And the yeah. thing crashed, and Buddy Colt was the uh, pilot. He survived. The only one that didn't survive was Bobby Shane. Is that, am I right, yeah. Bobby Shane? He, he didn't get his seatbelt off and he drowned. And I guess he couldn't swim. All the other, they were actually only in about six feet of water at that Tampa Bay thing. And so they got out. Gary Hart's leg was broken. Uh, it was bad, you know, but those guys survived. Do you have any stories about Bruno Sammartino? Uh, nothing but good stories. He was always a nice guy to me. I remember wrestling him twice just before he hung up the tights and he'd take me down and hold me down, <laughs> hold me down. I couldn't do nothing in the garden and the Boston Garden. But then I got my licks in and um, my dad didn't get along with him, you know, because he was a, he said, ah, they just gave him the belt because he was a 
Italian and New York was all Italian, but Bruno drew a lot of money and he was always nice to me, so good. I have good memories. Did you spend any time working full-time in a Texas territory? Any of the Texas wines like the Von Erichs or... I did a little bit in the Von Erichs, about three or four months, and I went to Atlanta. Um, right then I didn't use my dad's name yet, so it was hard to keep me there. And I did Amarillo, Texas with, uh, with Donnie Fargo. Good, good memories from there with Dory and Terry and, and her father. It was a great territory. Do you have any stories on work in the Boston Garden? Yeah. Um, well, you know, we, we had this ramp to get to the ring. The fans were very violent there, and they would try to get to you. Back, Blackjack Mulling, in fact, got knifed coming out of the ring. So then they built that platform. So they, they really couldn't get to me, but very rude. But they were just really into it. A worse pace would might be Wooster Mass, or not Wooster, excuse me, uh, Lowell Mass. It was terrible there. They'd, you know, you're in fear for your life. Wooster Mass, Kim Patera was coming out and he had this overhang balcony where you come out to the ring and someone threw a garbage can on his head. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, wow. They, they were, t Massachusetts people, I think, you know, I, I, you know, I love the area and everything, but I think they have, the fans are real rowdy there, even for other sports. I think, I think they're all mad because it, the weather sucks there so bad, and and the traffic is so bad. It's a hard place to stay in a good mood, you know. <laughs> a lot of elements, but great, great sports teams, Red Sox and New England Patriots. My God, do you think you could have had a good feud with Ric Flair over who he used the better figure for? That would have been great. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been good. Any memories of Baltimore? I remember losing the title there to Tito. Baltimore was a great wrestling town. I, I loved Baltimore. I liked, I liked going out afterwards and to Little Italy and, and all the seafood restaurants. But I remember the cage match that I had with Tito there. It was a great town. Enjoyed, always enjoyed going to Baltimore. Do you uh, follow the current product at all on TV? Just enough. Just enough. Is I, I DVR it and I run through it. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think it's good for me to know what's going on. In it's still my business. So, is there any wrestlers today you like watching? Well, I was, I'm a big fan of Randy Orton, John Cena, uh, The Undertaker. <laughs> I saw The Undertaker the other night, it was great. Um, you know, the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just close it there because I'm not really familiar with all the new guys I got. Where can fans uh, follow you online if they want to look you up? Well, I just started uh, a website, it's called Greg gregdehammer.com. I still got to do some more stuff to update it. And I'm also on Instagram, so. But I have a guy handling that for me too, so. I'm gonna be doing some shout outs so you'll know about it. And uh, I'm just barely debbing into that social media, social media thing. Any memories of your matches with Dory Funk, who's getting uh, an award this year at the Cauliflower Alley? Oh, is he? Yeah, he's here actually today. Yeah. Oh yeah, he uh, he liked to front face lock you and lean on you all the time. That's where I actually learned how to lean on my opponent to tire him out because that's what he would do. He'd lean on you and lean on you know and wear you down and. Put that front face lock on, and then he'd give you that European uppercut that he used to do. Um, 
Yeah, he was a leaner. He'd wear you out. <laughs> Any stories on Lord Alfred Hayes in recent years? People have come out saying he was a bit of a ladies' man. See, I didn't know that, but he, he was very articulate. I enjoyed his uh, commentating. And I actually remember him wrestling in Amarillo, too. And uh, all the English wrestlers that came over here, they had a certain style, but they they liked to work a lot of holds, and, and they were very believable. And uh, so it was fun to watch him back in the day. What was your biggest accomplishment in wrestling, in your opinion? Uh, going one hour with Bob Backlund. <laughs> That's a good, no, a lot of, a lot of good things. Uh, I'm kind of like Ric Flair, where I, I heard Ric Flair talk about all the hour long Broadways he did. So I, I was a specialty guy with going long matches. Most of my matches were 45 minutes or more. Someone wanted me to go earlier in 30 minutes. It was tough for me because it took me 10 minutes to warm up. But I, I old school, once again, you get tired of hearing that, but I like to make my matches like a story and, and, and work that same story throughout so I could paint a picture and produce what I wanted and have that good pop at the end of it and go out with a good feeling in the dressing room. That was my best feeling, other than getting paid good money, was to know that I did a good job out there and, and, uh, and that made, made me feel good. How did you like having Johnny V as your manager? He was funny. Uh, that only happened with tag team, with the dream team, and yeah. then a little bit with uh, the new dream team. He was funny, and I thought it was fine. He's a good guy. How God bless you, him, too. How did you like the Grand Wither Wizard? Ah, my best buddy of all time, and the very first time I came into New York, and he was more than just a manager. He'd call me at home. He'd tell me to gossip. He'd, he'd, he watched my back, literally, So, and he'd tell me anything that, if the office would say something good about me, he'd tell me. They never really said anything. I never heard anything bad they would say about me, but it was good, you know. He he had your back and he, was, he wasn't just there because they put you, they, the office put him with me. He, he really, especially with me, he reached out and uh, I went down to Fort Lauderdale and visited him and so, you know, it became a personal thing. What were some of your best lifts in the gym when you were in your prime because you were a pretty muscular guy at your peak? Wow, I never, I did a 410 pound bench press and that's about as heavy as I could go. I never made 500. Uh, and then I tore my pecs a little bit too, so. I quit doing heavy, but I, I did 410 bench press and, 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 and that was not with steroids. I did a little steroids, but I didn't like them. I didn't like the way they made me feel. Most of my, you know, my size was inherited from the six foot three, 270 pound Johnny Valentine. So I got most of that from him. What was the best piece of advice that he gave you over the years, Johnny Valentine? Don't sell out for a high spot. Don't listen to the people. Uh, don't run the ropes. Don't do goofy high spots. Uh, act, go to the gym and work out with the gloves so you know how to punch and fight for real. Go work some, learn some amateur stuff because I never learned that. And, uh, you know, just try to make it look like a shoot. Uh, I said, don't sell out for the pop, you know. He says, you grind them and you, you know, you're going to eventually get the people. Make them, make them think, you know, he gave me this, this thing inside me. He said, well, 
if they don't believe any other matches on this card tonight, they're going to believe my match. And so I, I kept that through my mind all the years. And I actually, uh, when I would get, you know, go through a long match, like 40 minutes, and I'm blown up and I'm thinking, would Johnny, what would Johnny Valentine do? And I had that inside me where it, it seemed like I would become my father. And I would look at some old matches and say, gee, I worked just like my father, except I speeded it up a little bit. And uh, so that's it, you know. Who did you like best as a tag team partner? Was it Beefcake or uh, one of the other partners you've had over the years? You've had I liked every partners? one of them, from Honky and Flair and Baron Von Rasky and Ray Stevens. My favorite was Beefcake, yeah. And having Knobs as a brother-in-law, what's that like, as crazy as he is? That's a... Oh my God, <laughs> I'm a laid back kind of guy. And when my wife first met him before we were married, uh, they were jumping off the roof of my house into my swimming pool. And, but you know what, they, they're both great guys and not a great guy, they're just crazy, you know? And uh, you know, for a long time, I hated Nobs as being my brother-in-law. <laughs> but now I like it, so. <laughs> I, so I gotta look at that face. Or, uh, but you know, he's he's been a good friend um, all these years, so. And so is Jerry Sags, too. Is there any tag team match that stands out to you as your favorite tag team match you ever had? Um, I think that we did a couple of them on Saturday night's main events, uh, Beefcake and myself against, with Johnny B in the corner, against the Bulldogs. The one where we slid over, where I beat, beat one of the Bulldogs, that's a favorite one. And then the one we did in Cleveland Saturday night's main event, where it was really our last shot at at getting our titles back, but that was one of my favorite matches too. They, they, they were, especially the first one, Saturday Night's Main Event. Do you have any memories of Eddie Graham from your Florida days? Very articulate guy, very smart guy. He would actually, he was the first one that would kind of pattern our matches out, because we're all still learning how to put in a match together. He would give us spots, you know, we had to remember all these spots, but they would work out to the finish that you were building to. So he, he would take time to teach us how to tell a story when we got in the ring. He was a very smart guy. He was a, he was a very good worker and everything. But he'd piece our matches together, and it wasn't like, you know, he had to, he was really showing us how to make a story, and you're working the arm, and the guy, baby face gets away, you get his arm back. That style of work, keep going back to that same arm hold all the time. And when you're young and green, and you got that to rely on, and go, oh, where do I go from here? You grab the arm again, and, and you go back to that same thing, or the headlock that you're working. So it really helped, he really helped me out a lot. What did you hear about his death, about uh, the reason why that he ended up putting himself away? Oh, God. No, that really shocked me, but, uh, you know, they try to say that, that the WWF was coming down there, taking over Florida, which they were, but he still had Florida going himself. Um, I heard it was a combination of things, but I heard it was a land deal gone bad. And, you know, I, I really, it's all speculatory, but, you know, I heard it was some kind of deal like that, separate from wrestling, that he took himself out. 
and I heard this horrible story, and I'll go ahead and share it, that he missed the first time. He just blew one side of his head out. Oh. And so he shot himself twice. Oh, that's horrible. Horrible. The Graham family, you know, the one of his grandkids took himself out, and Mike Graham took himself out, so it it's terrible, terrible scenarios there. Were you ever friends with uh, Gino Hernandez at all? I didn't know him. Okay. He was in Houston. I didn't know him, but he died from a drug overdose, right? Yeah. Yeah. He was very, he had, he had it down. I heard he was really over in Texas and he was drawing money. And I don't, he had some kind of relationship with Paul Blush, maybe? Yeah, there was always talk he may have been a illegitimate son or something. Something or like that. Or he was dating his mother or something. There was something there, yeah. but yeah, he was a, he really had a promising career and he, he OD'd. And I know you were pretty close with Jim Neidhart, who uh, wrestled for my company, Great North Wrestling, a lot. Uh, any thoughts on his passing? Any, any good stories about him to share as we close this off? Well, he was, he was a tremendous guy too, and he'd always go like this with his beard. And uh, <laughs> my wife Julie and I would have Ellie and him over a lot when we still lived in Florida, and we had some good times with him socially. Um, I was, I was really shocked that he passed away. I think he had a, he had a a problem with pills like a lot of guys have with pain pills and and uh, the way he died just I guess it was a brain aneurysm or something he just took a bump and uh, a lot of good stories and I'm, I'm of course I'm close to the family where I broke in with Brett and a lot of tragedies with that family and a one heart and it's a gem really shocked me to hear Jim pass away like that. What did you think about the whole thing that happened at the induction with the fan running in and taking Brett down? I heard about it and I thought right away that it was set up or that WWE set it up or something. Then I watched it and but I heard the reports that it wasn't. This guy was just a goof. But the way he came in and kind of gave him a schoolboy, you know, I'm glad that Brett didn't get hurt or anything. I go, oh, <laughs> but I guess the guys put the boots to him, and that made me happy. You know, what a goofball! And is there anything you want to say to the fans or anyone that's watched this to, to close this off today? You've done great, great stories. Yeah, I just uh, I I'm being completely honest about my career. And I enjoyed all the years, and I still feel a big part of uh, <clears throat> of the wrestling universe because I've never had to get a job yet. How about that? <laughs> a real job. Uh, but this is my job now. I'm, you know, I'm a spokesman for me, Greg the Hammer Valentine, but I'm a spokesman for wrestling in general and WWE and the WWE Universe and uh, and um, I enjoy, mainly I enjoy meeting you guys that were my fans and you and you brought your kids up showing matches of me on Google or the WWE Network and I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody saying that the 80s were the best because they were, but you know, we. We didn't have much, well, we had to follow the 60s and 70s, but we we blossomed this. You had WrestleMania 35, it's because we had WrestleMania 1. And um, I'm just glad to, to be here. God bless.